Hello, and welcome back to another class of the plain gospel and what we're supposed to do with it. This is class number three on the plain gospel and acts, and my name is Curtis Hartshorn. I'll be your instructor. I encourage you to get your workbook out if you have that. Hopefully you do. If not, you can get that through BibleTalk.tv. And also, if at all possible, have a Bible laid out in front of you. We're going to be starting in the book of Luke in the first chapter, so you can be opening up to that as we start looking at the, the plain gospel in Acts. And we'll not just be in Acts, we'll be in Luke. Luke wrote the gospel of Luke. He also wrote the book of Acts. And so those two books go well together and, and fit. And so we're going to be looking at that as we start with A, the pattern for preaching the gospel. By what pattern or how are we supposed to be preaching the gospel? We have several examples in the Bible that we're going to be looking at. The first one, number one, is we're going to look at angels. Angels had the good news and they announced it to men. In Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 18, it says, Zacharias said to the angel, How will I know this for certain? For I'm an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And the good news that he was receiving was about the son that was going to be born to him who would become John the baptizer. So we've backed up a little bit in time from where we were in our last class. But we want to see how angels brought good news. When they had good news to announce, they came and they presented that message and their responsibility was to present that message exactly the way that God had told that to him. And that is exactly the same way we're supposed to present the gospel or the good news just the way that it was told to or taught to us from Scripture. Second point that we see is that Christ our Savior coming to earth to bring salvation to everyone is indeed gospel or good news. In the second chapter of the book of Luke, starting in the eighth verse, we read in the same region there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today, in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Here's another angel, and we see a pattern again where he has good news, gospel, same word, good news to announce to people, and he announced that message exactly the way that God had told him to announce that message. He announced the plain gospel. Number three, the plain gospel is what brings souls into the kingdom. Now we're going to flip back to the Gospel of Matthew, but we're going to flip forward in time in our chronology of events. And we're going to look at right before the Sermon on the Mount, which I talked about last week, a sermon that is a gospel sermon that never mentions the death, burial, and the resurrection, and yet is indeed a gospel sermon. And we see in Matthew chapter 4, starting in verse 19, Jesus is speaking to Simon and, and Andrew, Simon, Peter, and Andrew. He says to them in verse 19, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in a boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father, and they followed him. Jesus was going throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming 
the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. So here is Jesus and he is preaching the gospel. We have the example of the angels. Now we have the example of Jesus himself. And he is going about and preaching the gospel. I was going to share with you one of the things that I've done to prepare for this class is I, I've printed off every time in the Bible the word gospel or good news is mentioned. And I read these usually at night. I, I read them before I go to bed. It's about six pages here of scriptures. And that's helped me to get the overall picture of the gospel. And also, I want you to understand that I know that this doesn't tell the whole gospel because just because a passage doesn't mention good news or gospel doesn't mean it's not about the gospel. In fact, the entire gospel of John never once mentions the word gospel, and yet that's what the whole book is about. And so you can see how far-reaching this study is and how much there there is to knowing the gospel of God. We've seen a pattern for preaching the gospel. Let's look now at the benefits of the gospel. And the first one that I want to look at, number one, is the gospel has an element to it which is a benefit to the poor. Now we've already looked at Matthew chapter 11, verses 4 through 5, and I showed that to you there. I want to put another scripture up. You can turn to it in Luke chapter 4, or I'll put it on the screen here for you. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recover a sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed. And so both Matthew and Luke mention this preaching of the gospel to the poor. And then Luke mentions it again in chapter 7, verse 22. Where he says, And he answered instead of them, Go and report to John what you've seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have the gospel preached to them. You know, of all the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Luke brings out this idea of ministering to the poor more than the others. Not really sure why, but that was something that was very important to him. You know the way the Sermon on the Mount starts off in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 3 it talks about blessed are the poor in spirit. Well, if you look at Luke's account, starting in Luke chapter 6 and verse 20, his starts off, blessed are the poor, not poor in spirit. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. There's something about the poor in a society. They don't receive the privileges that other members of society receive because they're not able to afford them. But when it comes to the gospel, the gospel is just as available to them as it is to anyone because the gospel is free of charge. And so there's a benefit. Of course, that gospel is a benefit to everybody, but it is a benefit that is available to the poor. This gospel also connects us to good people we would normally miss out on. Now let's get to the book of Acts. As we turn to chapter 8, we see in Acts chapter 8, starting in verse 5, that Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. Now, the significance of this is Samaria was a place that was generally off limits to Jews because they were very prejudiced against the Samaritans. But here, because of the gospel, Philip is overcoming his prejudice. He's going to a city he wouldn't normally go to and preach to a people he wouldn't normally have anything to do with, to be quite honest but he preaches the gospel to them. In verse 9 it says, Now there was a man named Simon who formerly had practiced magic in the city and was astonishing the people of Samaria, claiming to be someone great. And they all, from smallest to the greatest, were giving attention to him, saying, This man is called the great power of God. And they were giving him attention because he had for a long time astonished them with his magic arts. <laughs> 
But when they believe Philip preaching the good news, preaching the gospel about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized, men and women alike. Even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued on with Philip. And as he observed signs and great miracles taking place, and he was constantly amazed. When we are preaching the gospel, sometimes that gospel leads us to people that normally we might have a prejudice against. To, preju to be prejudiced is to prejudge. And when you prejudge, you assume something about a people, and that prevents you from meeting some pretty good people. The gospel can break down that barrier. It can break down the racism and the prejudice between people and connect good people together. That's one of the benefits of the gospel. Another benefit of the gospel is that after the, the plain gospel is preached to people, they tend to get baptized. That's the benefit of salvation through Jesus. We see this in verse 12, that the people heard the good news and they were baptized, men and women alike. In the next verse, even Simon, the Simon the sorcerer, was baptized as well. Baptism is a response to the gospel. It's not the gospel itself. Baptism is the result of the gospel. Remember, we looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17, where Paul says, I wasn't sent to baptize. I was sent to preach the gospel. But when the gospel is preached, people get baptized. That means in your presentation of the gospel, if that's not the response you're getting, if people are not getting baptized, something is wrong with your gospel message because that should be the response. People who believe, they repent of their sins, and they're baptized into Christ. And at that point, they receive salvation. That's the gospel. That's the result of the gospel. The fourth benefit of the gospel is, the gospel helps us to turn away from vain worship. In chapter 14 of the book of Acts, and here is where Paul and Barnabas are on a mission and they have uh, visited a couple of cities on their way up north. They're, they're working their way into the region we know as Galatia. The Galatian letter was written to the churches that we're going to be reading about. He's been to Iconium in the, the first few verses there. And we'll start in verse 8 as he is at Lystra. It says, At Lystra a man was sitting who had no strength in his feet, lame, from his mother's womb, who had never walked. This man was listening to Paul as he spoke, who, when he had fixed his gaze on him and had, been, and had seen that he had faith to be made well, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. And he leaped up and he began to walk. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they raised their voice, saying in the Lyconian language, The gods have become like men and have come down to us. And they began calling Barnabas Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates, and they wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of it, they tore their robes. They rushed out into the crowd, crying out and saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We are all men of the same nature as you and preach the gospel to you that you should turn away from these vain things to a living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In the generations gone by, he permitted all the nations to go on their way. And yet he did not leave himself without witness in that he did good and gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness, even saying these things. It was with difficulty that they restrained the crowds from offering sacrifices to them. So here's Paul and Barnabas, and they're presenting this gospel. They're trying to help people 
work their way out of these vain things. But as he heals this man who had never walked in his life, and he stands upright and he's walking, they say, oh, the gods are among us. Paul and Barnabas have to go right down in the crowd and say, look, we're, we're men, we're flesh and blood just like you. We're not gods. Serve the one God, the one true living God. And they're pleading with them to leave their vain ways. This is a benefit even today where people worship God vainly. To do something vainly means to waste their time. God can rescue us. The gospel can rescue us from vain worship as it teaches us the truth about how to be saved. The fifth benefit of the gospel, repenting, turning away from vain living, is part of the message of the gospel. I noticed as I was reading through there in chapter 14, verse 16, where he says, In the generations gone by, he permitted all the nations to go their own ways. That reminded me of chapter 17, which sounds very similar in verse 30. It says, therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent. To repent is to do a 180. If you're going towards sin, you turn and you go away from that. So repenting, turning away from vain living, that's part of the blessing, part of the benefit of the gospel message. This and so many others we could look at. But there are great benefits of this gospel. Let's look at our, our last area of study, C, the gospel of the early church. We really want to capture what is this gospel. And we're blessed with an example, several examples really, but we're going to look at one specific example where we can watch the gospel being preached. And it's Peter. Peter preached the message of the gospel to Cornelius. Now, we'll, we'll stop in chapter 15, turn back to Acts chapter 15, and look with me at verse 7. This is the council of Jerusalem, and notice what Peter says in verse 7. He says, After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brethren, you know that the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. What's Peter talking about? He's talking about Acts chapter 10 when he preached the gospel to the household of Cornelius. He says, it's by my mouth that the, these Gentiles, Cornelius was a Gentile, he and his household, they heard the word by my mouth. And so let's turn back to chapter 10 and let's look at when the gospel was preached. And we're going to narrow this down to just the words that he preached that is called the gospel. And notice the way he presents it. Chapter 10 of Acts, verse 34. Opening his mouth. What did Acts 15 say? He say? His, that this message came, he said, by my mouth. So opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality. But in every nation... The man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. And what Peter is saying, it doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile. That man who's willing to accept him, God's going to reward him. Verse 36, the word which he sent to the sons of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all, and he means all, all people. You yourselves know the thing which took place through all Judea, starting from Galilee, after the baptism which John proclaimed. You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. We are witnesses of all the things he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They also put him to death by hanging him on a cross. God raised him up on the third day and granted that he become visible, not to all people, but to witnesses who were chosen beforehand by God 
that this to us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he ordered us to preach to the people and solemnly to testify that this is the one who has been anointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. Of him all the prophets bear witness that through his name everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. That's the very words which in Acts chapter 15 verse 7, Peter says, those Gentiles heard the gospel by my lips. We just read the gospel message that was preached that day. This is the gospel of the early church. Now, the second point I want to make about this is this plain gospel needs to be heard so that people can believe. Go back to chapter 15, and we'll, we'll start in verse 6 this time. It says, The apostles and the elders came together to look into this matter, and after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brethren, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, testifies to them, giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. A person needs to hear the gospel so they can believe. You can't believe in something that you've never heard about. And so our responsibility, Christians, is to proclaim this gospel, the plain gospel, just exactly the way they did in the first century. We don't need to change it. We don't need to alter it. We just present the gospel. Now, when we do, number three, the plain gospel is our door by which we receive the saving grace of God and by which we extend that to others as well. Keep going in the book of Acts. Let's go to chapter 20. Acts chapter 20 and verse 22. And now behold, bound by the Spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem. Now this is Paul talking. Not knowing what will happen to me there, verse 23, except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions await me. But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. You notice how Paul describes the gospel? This is the gospel of the grace of God. This is the good news of the grace of God. And so the gospel that was preached in the early church, the one that we're pattering ourselves after, to, was a gospel about grace. There again, if your presentation of the gospel does not include grace, does, if it doesn't talk about the grace of God, there's something missing in your gospel message. That's part of the message is God's grace. We need God's grace. There's no way... We can ever be right with God just based on our own merits and trying to do perfectly all the time. We've got to have the grace of God. That has to be included in this message. And Paul is saying this is the gospel of grace. Fourth and final point. I want you to know that this, this plain gospel gives our lives purpose. Paul, as he's talking about, and he knows this is the end of his life. He's going on to Jerusalem. He's going to stand trial there. He'll go from there to Rome. It's close to the end, and he knows that. But he says in verse 24, I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I receive. He says, my purpose, my sustenance for living is in the gospel. That's where, where I, I get my nourishment. That's where I get my purpose in life. It's not in the things of this world. It's in the gospel. I'm telling you, this gospel is powerful. It can change you. It can give you purpose.
It can give you the grace of God that you need. But you have to believe it. And we as Christians, we want to make sure we're preaching this gospel exactly the way the Bible says it should be preached. Yeah, thank you so much for being with me as we look at the plain gospel in Acts. We have seven more classes to go. The next one is going to be on Romans. We're going to talk about Romans obligated to the plain gospel. And so I hope you will stick with it for the series. There's going to be 10 lessons all together. And uh, just hope that this is going to be an enjoyable and a beneficial series for you. God bless.